Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us today on our first um, start of the Diversity Matters series. Uh, this one will be strengthening pipelines for the diverse tech talent in the capital region. Uh, and to start, I will introdu uh, introduce uh, Deb Hodge. Thank you, Ramir. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, thank you for joining us this morning, as Ramir said, for our first session in our Diversity Matters series. Um, we have a really exciting program for you today. Um, my name is Deb Hodge. I am the Acting Managing Director for the Greater Washington Partnerships Capital Collab. Um, and I'm just going to start by uh, providing just a little bit of context and background. If we could go to the next screen. So you'll see on the slide here, despite the capital region's position as a major tech hub with one of the nation's most well-educated populations, education and economic opportunities are out of reach for too many of our residents. Um, addressing these inequities is not only a, a moral imperative, but also an economic one. Without expanding the way academic institutions and employers prepare and source talent, the region risks 60,000 digital tech and tech adjacent jobs going unfilled annually by 2025. The Greater Washington Partnership launched the Collaborative of Leaders in Academia and Business, um, otherwise known as CoLab, to prepare more learners from more backgrounds for the in-demand digital tech jobs of today and tomorrow. If we could go to the next slide. Um, through this work, the CoLab aims to build and scale educator employer partnerships that expand learners access to industry validated digital tech competencies. So we have a network of 18 major employers, 27 higher education institutions, and five K-12 uh, school systems. So if we go to the next slide, we'll, we'll see the, the higher ed institutions that are part of our network. Um, and then if we go to the next slide, you'll, you'll see the CoLab's vision is that the capital region will have the most diverse digital tech workforce in the country. Our mission is to build the capital region's diverse digital tech ecosystem by just doing that, partnering with employers and educators to build industry aligned digital tech pathways um, that really have a focus on inclusive growth. Um, we, we've set some outcomes and goals for ourselves. By 2025, the CoLab will have engaged 45,000 students and adult learners in digital tech pathways, um, ensure at least 50% of the people we engage are from underserved populations. And we also aim to double the number of partner organizations we're working to scale CoLab initiatives. And if we go to the next slide, um, I think this is really important. Um, you know, that the core of our work is in diversity, equity, and inclusion. And we approach DEI at Co Capital Collab um, a few different ways. We use data to hold ourselves and the region accountable for our diversity goals. Um, we engage diverse partners to ensure that we're driving inclusive growth. And we embed diversity in, and inclusion in all of our programs and processes. Um, so now that you've had a little quick overview about the Greater Washington Partnership and Capital CoLab, um, I'm going to pass it off to Robert Owens, um, who is our Director of Workforce, Workforce Initiatives, to talk about our work-based learning strategy. Rob? Thank you so much, Deb. Thank you, everyone, for joining us this morning. As Deb said, I'm the Director for Workforce Initiatives at the Greater Washington Partnership Capital CoLab. In 2020, Capital CoLab enlisted the help of Higher Ed Insight to conduct a landscape analysis of work-based learning in the capital region. HEI sought to understand practices that increase representation of learners amongst populations that have been historically excluded from digital tech and identify strategies that contribute to equitable work-based learning opportunities and outcomes. Now, from that landscape analysis, Capital CoLab has developed our own work-based learning strategy. Now, our work-based learning report outlines the goals and strategies that CoLab will pursue as we engage over 45,000 learners in its programs by 2025, with at least half, like Deb said, that's coming from underrepresented populations. Now, 
You see this QR code. Our workplace learning strategy report can be viewed on your mobile device right now. So take your phone and point it to that QR code shown on the middle of your screen. And what would happen is the next four slides, you'll be able to get a copy of our report. Now, again, it will show at the top of your screen that you have this little you know, icon to view the report. Now, if you aren't able to pull down the report right now on your device, don't worry, we will make sure that we will provide you with the strategy uh, after this presentation. So let's get into part of the strategy here at Capital Collab. I'm very fortunate to oversee work-based learning and diversity here at the Great Washington Partnership. And as you can see, Collab defines work-based learning as an educational activity comprises meaningful workplace experience that facilitate academic, technical, and employability skills developed to support entry or advance along a career pathway. Now, as you can see here, our continuum of digital tech work-based learning capture many of the ways employers can offer professional awareness, exposure, engagement, and immersion to students who are involved in a digital tech work-based learning program. Now, if you look at the first pillar, with career awareness, students are learning about the work. Now, this is part of the continuum to build awareness of the variety of digital tech careers available and the role of post-secondary education to broaden student options. The next pillar, in career exposure, students are learning for work. They explore digital tech career options and post-secondary for the purpose of motivating students and to inform their decision-making in high school and post-secondary education. The third pillar, career engagement. This is an opportunity where students can learn through work. We apply digital tech learning through practical experience that develops knowledge and skills necessary for success in career and post-secondary education. And the last pillar, in career immersion, students are learning to work. Students train for digital tech employment and our post-secondary education in a specific range or occupation. Now, the work-based learning community in the capital region is rapidly evolving. And as the environment evolves, CoLab sees this role as threefold with the following goals over the next two years. We aim to inspire capital region employers to act with a shared sense of urgency around creating equitable, equitable excuse me, work-based learning opportunity that advance diverse particip participation in tech talent pipelines. We also strive to increase employer capacity to develop and sustain equitable work-based learning in digital tech and lastly, we plan to create an equitable and efficient work-based learning ecosystem by collaborating with employers, work-based learning providers, educators, and other intermediaries to identify gaps and leverage successful efforts. Now, to keep pace with the region's demand for digital tech skill set, employers must clearly signal their talent needs, proactively invest in their workforce pipeline, and deliberately do so with an equitable lens. Now, collaborate and unite employers as we have been doing through our webinars, through engagement, catalyzing, and convening around a common understanding of the urgency for equitable work-based learning. Now, Colab will also do this by building and supporting partnership with other key stakeholders, including groups in Baltimore, more in DC and also in Richmond. We share a sense of urgency and commitment to expanding and diversifying the tech talent ecosystem to inspire capital region employers to act with a shared sense of urgency around creating equitable work-based learning opportunities that advance diverse participation in tech talent pipeline. Now, how would we do this? CoLab will do this by working with employers who identify talent-related DEI initiatives, diversity, equity, including initiatives in their own organizations and consider the continuum of digital tech workforce work-based learning as a way of supporting these initiatives. We will also elevate employer efforts in the capital region and their motivation for investing in work-based learning via panels, webinars such as this, and other public-facing events. We will also convene local employers around initiatives that would benefit from the region, which is also gonna be a scalable and an approachable way. Now, next slide. Work-based learning helps learners gain professional experience before they start a full-time job. 
which is especially important for low income students and for those who have fewer professional networks. Despite these well documented benefits, there are too few opportunities for students to participate in work based learning from secondary school through college in the capital region. Now, Colab Strength is about building mutually beneficial and sustained relationships with large employers in the region and by connecting them with partners across the sectors. We plan to do this by increasing employer capacity to develop and sustain equitable work-based learning in digital, co in digital tech. Now, CoLab will do this by expanding how employers implement work-based learning in their own organizations, encouraging them to engage in multiple and distinct ways that align with their business needs, to advocate for work-based learning as an equitable talent development strategy to meet their employer's needs and to diversify the digital tech workforce, and to pilot innovative, recordable, work-based learning programs with collab partners that provide opportunities for capital region students to engage with employers in new ways. Now, our landscape analysis with Higher Ed Insight recognized the benefits of diverse coalition of intermediaries to build work-based learning capacity in the region. There are incredible intermediaries along great work in this space and collab remains committed to supporting them as CoLab regularly identifies new partners and convenes key stakeholders from across the region, it draws on lessons learned from specific metro areas within our footprint, which covers Washington, D.C., Baltimore, and Richmond, and all in between, and expands insight across the capital region. Now, we plan to drive an equitable and efficient work-based learning system through collaboration. CoLab will do three things. We will ensure that there are sufficient opportunities for diverse learners in all four phases of the digital tech continuum of work-based learning, as we discussed earlier. We will also collaborate with work-based learning stakeholders via Collab's Community of Practice website portal to discuss work-based learning progress and goals for the region. And we will represent Collab employers and in other media areas throughout the capital region. Now, in line with our strategy to create an equitable and efficient work-based learning system, I wanna now shift and introduce you to our speakers for today who provide insight on Lead for IT. It's a program that's funded by the US Department of Labor and it provides up to 50% of wage reimbursements for businesses who participate in this initiative. Now this program equips businesses to better attract, build and strengthen their IT and cybersecurity workforce with formal training and work-based learning programs to upskill present employees, as well as train new workers in IT cybersecurity. So the two people we'll be hearing from is Emily Apple, Newberry. She's the senior manager of workforce initiatives and private solutions at ICF and Chris Goss, vice president for talent at Next Tier Concept. So let me give you some background about Emily. See, Emily leads the workforce specialist with the workforce innovation team at ICF. She works with businesses, institutions, and higher education, K-12 systems, and community-based organizations to design and create work-based learning opportunities that fit local workforce needs, especially for IT cybersecurity occupations. In her other roles at ICF, Ms. Apple Newberry leads research and evaluation on innovation workforce training solutions. She regularly assists public agencies and community-based programs in making their work more data-driven by mapping program theory and examining their collection use of data. So she will provide insight on the lead for IT program. The other person you hear from later on is Chris Walsh, who serves as the vice president of talent for NT Concepts, a data-driven solution provider who works on sensitive and mission-critical programs at the National Security, which is headquartered in Tysus Corner. Chris has 28 years of experience developing people and leading teams, including 20 years of service with the U.S. Marine Corps and multiple tours in operations in Iraq and Enduring Freedom. Thank you, Chris, for your service to our country. Chris will provide insight on as to how businesses can utilize this program, Lead for IT. So I'm gonna first kick it off to uh, Emily Apple Newberry to provide more teaser, more details rather, excuse me, about Lead for IT program and give us some context as how this could fit into your work-based learning ecosystem. Emily, take it away. Awesome. Thanks so much, Robert, for that introduction of ICF and uh, my work on the Lead for IT project. I'm very excited to tell everyone about the Lead for IT project, which just got underway in January of this year. It's a great way that we are that we ICF through support from the US Department of Labor and in our partnership with the Capital CoLab are able to support businesses in investing in work based learning opportunities and opportunities for professional development for new and existing employees. 
LEAD for IT stands for the Learning, Employment, and Economic Development for Information Technology. ICF and with support from DOL see the value that work-based learning plays for helping companies across the, across the capital region and in, indeed across the nation invest in their IT workforce and make sure that uh, we can identify a pipeline of workers with those skills um, that maybe can be um, developed through post-secondary training, but in addition to that, need to be developed through work-based learning, through experience applying those theoretical and technical concepts in, um, in real workplace scenarios, which is really the essence of work-based learning. Next slide, please. So Lead for IT, our project, is a four-year effort, like I said, that started in January 2021. Uh, funded, it's funded with an $8.6 million grant from the US Department of Labor to guide and financially support businesses in implementing these forms of work-based learning or work-based training. So the Lead for IT project really dovetails nicely with CoLab's goal of increasing employer capacity to develop and sustain equitable work-based learning in digital tech, because our, our occupations of focus are those that are um, around IT and cybersecurity. And so if you are a company or if you are partnering with a company that is looking to build out your workforce in IT and cybersecurity talent, and you are you know, hearing from Capital CoLab about work-based learning and you're thinking, hey, this is, this is a strategy that I could use either with young people or with career changers who are a little bit um, later in their, in their career, ICF's Lead for IT project can support you in actually setting up the mechanics of setting up that work-based learning program and a little bit with helping to offset the costs of that as well. We can work with for-profit or non-profit employers and in this first year, we're really focused on employers in DC, Maryland, and Virginia. But um, starting next year, we'll work with employers who are outside the DMV area. So I, my message with that would be to say, contact me soon so that we can help you now while we're focused on the DMV area, uh, because I know this is gonna get big really fast. Could I have the next slide, please? The four partners involved in delivering the Lead for IT project are ICF, Franklin Apprenticeships, Skill Source Group, and the, Vienna Cham the Virginia Chamber Foundation. ICF is a global professional services form, firm founded in 1969 that specializes in IT modernization, cybersecurity, inclusive economic transformation, and data analytics. Franklin Apprenticeship, our partner, is a recognized apprenticeship expert that delivers high quality tech technology apprenticeships for occupations, including help desk, mainframe system administrator, and mainframe application developer. We partner on the workforce side with the Skill Source Group, which is the nonprofit fiscal agent of Virginia CareerWorks Northern, which is the region's workforce development board, as well as the Virginia Chamber Foundation, which is, supports the efforts of the Virginia Chamber of Commerce including representing the 26,000 businesses and institutions of higher education in Virginia. Next slide, please. So how can Lead for IT help your company um, institute models of work-based learning? What we can do is we can connect business recruiters and talent acquisition specialists to sources of diverse talent, both at post-secondary institutions and training institutions and through other uh, less tapped means, such as high school CTE programs and workforce development organizations. We can reimburse costs associated with delivering work-based learning training and also help you identify additional funds that are available to support these new models of training. We realize that it can be hard to find candidates that have 100% of everything that your business demands. And so we've found a way to help mitigate that risk. Next slide, please. So work-based training has been around in some form for a long time. It supports the business community by adding staff capacity, productivity, and training at a reduced cost to the employer. Obviously, 
classroom training is an important part of ramping up the skill sets of an individual. And that work-based learning is the chance to apply those skills to the individual workplace. So, you know, this is involved in every position. We've been doing this forever. There's always some ramp up time when, a new, when an individual starts in a new position. Um, work-based learning really formalizes that ramp up period, allows the employer and the employee to set specific goals for competencies to develop and timelines and a way to measure those. So it formalizes a lot of the work that you're already doing so that um, individuals on both sides can be held accountable. The models, uh, the form formats of work-based learning that lead for IT can help um, support you in setting up and offsetting the cost of include apprenticeships, classroom training that lead to your credential, on-the-job training, training to upskill current workers, also known as incumbent worker training, and paid internships and work experience. Can I have the next slide? So in the continuum of digital tech work-based learning that Robert introduced you to a few minutes ago, you can see that the models of work-based learning that lead for IT supports are kind of more on the right-hand side, the engagement and immersion models. And it's because these, these models are a deeper experience for the learner and they require a higher level of investment from the employer. So that's where lead for IT comes in to help provide assistance on setting those up and financial assistance to offset those costs. Uh, next slide, please, to the scenarios. Thanks so much. Let's look at some scenarios for how um, companies might use work-based learning and how Lead for IT can support those. Let's go to the first one. With a transitioning service member, um, this, um, Lead for IT places an emphasis on um, serving and helping companies hire transitioning service members, veterans, and military spouses. The benefits of um, hiring transitioning service members and veterans is that they often already have clearance, like the person in this example, and they may come with some IT experience. But because they have limited workforce, civilian workforce experience, though they have those technical skills, they need to know how to apply their technical skills that they um, built up in the military to civilian um, IT systems. So in this scenario, next slide, please you might want to use a model like on the job training. So in this individual where we have, in this scenario where we have a transitioning service member who is becoming a computer systems analyst in the civilian sector, um, in the DMV area, the salary, a median salary for that position is about $40 an hour. Based on the skills and competencies that this person is building up in in joining this role, in the taking on this role as computer system analyst. Um, the Department of Labor believes that um, on the job training period of about 16 weeks or four months is reasonable, feasible, and appropriate. So that's 640 hours. So we can provide the Lead for IT program would help you set up that the learning plan, set up the competencies for what the person is going to learn over that 16 weeks. Um, and then once that individual is on payroll, a lead for IT could support with cost reimbursement of anywhere between 50 to 90% of that person's wages during those 16 weeks. The 50 to 90% is based on the size of the company, a small company, 50 or fewer employees would get 90% reimbursement, medium company, um, 250 or fewer uh, would get 75% reimbursement and large company, uh, larger than 250 employees would uh, receive a 50% uh, reimbursement. So you can see that that is um, a good deal of funds that would be able to support and offset the costs of hiring some of a business hiring somebody who maybe they wouldn't have hired otherwise if they hadn't known that they're going to have this work-based learning period of OJT, on-the-job training, to get them ramped up in that position. I want to reinforce that um, On-the-job training is a higher first program. The trainee is a full-time regular employee who works no less than 35 hours per week. They actually, the employee is in no way associated with ICF. Our support, our contract is with you as the business and the employee is your employee, your normal W-2 employee. The trainee per, um, performs their tasks that are essential to their job function 
under the supervision of a manager, coach, or mentor. And that's standard to the OJT model, whether it's supported by Lead for IT or not. That's a universal model in, in workforce development. And it's one of those ones that Robert talked about um, that Capital CoLab supports as well. Can we go to the next example? Great. So many of us focus our recruiting um, at the college level by using internships as a way to bring promising college students in and try them out for a couple of months, give them a chance to see what our workforce looks like and, and give us a chance to, to check out their skills and their adaptability to the workplace um, in anticipation of hopefully making an offer after they graduate. Lead for IT definitely, this is one of the classic forms of work-based learning and Lead for IT can definitely support it. We can help connect you with the pipeline, um, including those that will help you identify, help you diversify your workforce by looking at colleges and programs that are maybe outside the pool of, um, of four-year institutions that you normally work with. That's also something that Capital CoLab can can help with. So we're going to be working together very closely on this initiative to make sure that we're bringing you a di diverse pipeline of students to, um, to bring into these work-based learning positions that we help you create. So this college student, you know, they may be enrolled in an IT or cybersecurity degree program, so they have the theory, but not the practical application. And this is where the internship comes in. Next slide, please. And this is how um, Lead for IT can support an internship. Internships, you know, it's at the the length is at the employer's discretion. You know, maybe a summer internship uh, would be two to three months. Maybe you're going to pay them a monthly stipend of two thousand dollars per month. ICF can help uh, reimburse the cost of wages paid. We can support you at fifty percent of wages paid up to a cap of two thousand dollars per intern. So what that means is because an internship You'll notice that this is a, um, a lower level of reimbursement than the on-the-job training model. And the next one I'm gonna show you, it's because on-the-job training, they are a full, you know, full employee, W-2 employee usually, with the expectation of continued employment. So that's why there's the higher level of reimbursement and support available to you through the Lead for IT. The internship, it's just a chance for you each to explore um, for the company to explore the, the worker and the worker to explore your company as a potential career um, and employer. So that's why the uh, support, why the fiscal support is, is capped at $2,000. All right, can we, can we go through the uh, next scenario, which is the last one I, I promise that I'm gonna share today. I just wanna give you an example of all the different people that you could be hiring and all the different ways that people could come into work-based learning that are going to diversify your workforce and that Lead for IT can support. So in this example, um, we have a career changer who has aptitude for IT, maybe a credential here or there, but not a degree and, and not, um, not substantial work experience in the IT and cybersecurity, IT cybersecurity field. They have maybe um, I guess this guy looks like he's a waiter or a line cook or something like that. So he um, he is a hard hard worker, and he but he if he wants to change into a different career path is what his goal is. So a form of work based learning model that might work well for him and for the employer that wants to bring him into their their uh, workforce is called an apprenticeship, a registered apprenticeship. Can you go to the next slide, please? Registered apprenticeships are the most um, rigorous and formal version of work-based learning. It's an employer-driven model that combines on-the-job training, like I talked about a few minutes ago, with that job-related classroom instruction. So it's really giving um, the employee both sides of, um, of the training, both in the classroom and on the job, to really invest in their skills. And from the employer, what's great about it is that it means that the employer is pretty much directing them which degree program and um, which courses to take. So they're making sure that their investment in this employee is in building exactly the skills that they, that they want. It is a pretty rigorous model. Like I mentioned, an apprenticeship, a registered apprenticeship would get registered with either the US Department of Labor or, the, or a state Department of Labor. Um, 
It would last generally, it's 12 to 24 months. So it's a rigorous undertaking and investment. But workers learn practical and theoretical aspects of a highly skilled occupation. And employers, in return, they get to have a, a highly skilled worker. Um, and I'll talk about the retention um, statistics in a few minutes here. So you can see that how I how, how this kind of, again, you can see how an apprenticeship would work and how Lead for IT would support it. So with a registered apprenticeship, the business might use um, a third party apprenticeship um, manager, such as Franklin, our partner Franklin Apprenticeships, because like I said, you have to register it with the US DOL or the state DOL. And so it's a little bit more um, involved of a model. And so it can be good to have some extra handholding from a third party administrator like that. The duration is at the employer's discretion, again, like I said, but generally 12 to 24 months. During that 12 months, the employee would also be spending time in the classroom or virtual learning at a post-secondary institution of about 144 hours. And so you can see how Lead for IT can support this, um, the apprenticeship model in a stackable way. So we can support three aspects of this registered apprenticeship model. We can support the on-the-job training with a wage reimbursement, anywhere from 50 to 90% during that OJT period, which like I said, can be a substantial amount of time, 12 to 24 months to get that wage reimbursement. We can help offset the cost of um, the third party apprenticeship administration, and we can help offset the cost of that classroom training uh, at 50% of up, at up to $2,000. And I don't even need to tell you there, are, you know, in Virginia, in Maryland, in DC, there are so many other, there are lots of other sources of funding that are, um, that are targeted to offsetting employers' costs when they're um, investing in their employees' um, professional development and continuing education, particularly when you're leveraging something like a community college. And we could help you tap into all those other available sources um, of support to try to get that that bottom uh, figure for how much you're paying for this employee's professional development and to grow this employee as small as possible. All these public sector agencies and these projects are aligned to encourage workforce development that is driven by the employer. So it's you as the employer stating what skills you need employees to learn and making sure that they are, that the employees are taking training that is going to be uh, result in them having the skills that you need. Next slide, please. Um, yeah, great. So if you don't have any experience, just quickly, I'm gonna talk about um, Franklin apprenticeships. If you don't have experience or the capacity to operate a registered apprenticeship in-house, one option is to work with a third party administrator like our, our partner, Franklin apprenticeships. Next slide, please. Franklin has a proven model to identify good fit employees and train them up via the registered apprenticeship model. They do talent sourcing from um, their own proprietary um, sources of way of being able to recruit candidates. So they're gonna be able to reach a very a div a diverse talent pool that you might not be able to reach through your existing recruiting efforts. They do an assessment <clears throat> for the individual occupation that you are interested in, in, in hiring an, an a, uh, apprentice for, those who get past, uh, who pass the assessment would do a pre-apprenticeship to build some of those foundation, foundational skills and get some basic digital credentials. Then in, Franklin would work with you, your company, to go through the interview process to select who among those apprentices that have gone through the pre-apprenticeship you would like to hire and bring on as a full-time employee, 12 to 18 months building technical and soft skills through a registered apprenticeship where uh, Franklin coaches provide structure, support, and accountability and your, and your staff um, provide this daily, the day-to-day -day supervision in their, in their on-the-job training. The result is employers um, get to have qualified tech workers with competence proven through their work on the job, with diverse backgrounds and perspectives, and with research says with a 94% retention rate for those who have come through an apprenticeship program. So it's a really thorough, thorough model, I would say, 
to being able to identify people who, you know, may not be coming through your um, existing talent pipelines and bringing them in and building up those skills um, so that you have exactly the tech worker that you want. Um, the, the candidate pool that Franklin is able to attract on the, on the early part of their screening is very diverse. It's 50% Black, Indigenous, people of color, 30% women, 60% individuals with no college degree, and 15% veterans. So if you're starting with a pool like that, you're more likely to end up with an employee, your qualified tech worker at the end, who is who represents that diversity that the pool, that the initial pool brought you. All right, Ramir, can you skip to the employer next steps slide for me, please? Awesome, thanks so much. This is just, um, I'm out of time, so I'm gonna tell you that this is just a, a snapshot of how we work with employers to get them started in lead for IT. We, you know, we kind of set up a statement of work. We understand what kind of positions you're hiring for. We help you select um, employees and develop and implement the training, the work-based learning training program. And then as we're starting to report progress and collect outcomes, you're able to submit invoices um, for wages paid and um, <clears throat> classroom training supported and get reimbursed through the Lead for IT project. Um, can we go to the last slide with my contact information? Great, so I wanna share my contact information. Here's my email address and my telephone number, which is 703-225-2409. You can also, of course, reach out and connect with me through Robert and the other folks at uh, the Greater Washington Partnership. Um, because we're interested, we're actively recruiting employer partners right now to work with, to help set up and, and financially support new models of work-based learning at their organization, or to help you grow and scale models of work-based learning that you may already support at your organization. So I hope that this presentation has given you some ideas about the variety of different models that work-based learning encompasses so that you can think about how, hey, that might actually apply at my workplace. And I would be interested in working with the CoLab and ICF to get those set up. All right, and I, yeah, I'm excited for our next speaker. It's someone I've worked with a lot. So Robert, can I hand it off thank, to you? Thank you so much, Emily. We're really excited for this partnership with the Capital Collab, as well as with ICF, and also with support from the Department of Labor. Um, I want to now shift over to Chris Cross. Uh, Chris, wanted to bring you up now to see if you can talk more about NT Concept and how your organization's overall plan is to work to provide more equitable opportunities here in the capital region. Chris? Absolutely, thanks Robert, and thanks Emily. So uh, before I start, I just wanna kind of talk about why I'm here and then I'll, I'll spend a minute on who we are and then kind of get into the, to the, to the meat of this, which is really only about five or 10 minutes. But why I'm here is we're a use case uh, for Lead for IT. If we weren't the first, Emily, I think we we're one of the first um, employer partners with ICF um, and we are, in the process right now. We've got three interns on um, and, and we've got contracts signed with ICF. So we're, we're using the program right now. So I can, I can talk to that and, and what a great, uh, and just what a great program that is. Um, the other piece of that is, is I do wanna talk about, as Robert mentioned, I, I wanna talk about the um, pipeline diverse tech talent. And really I wanna stress the importance of partnerships. Uh, so next slide, please. So just a little bit about us. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on here. As I mentioned, this is really about partnerships, not about NT concepts. But just so uh, people on the line know who we are, we're government contractors. Um, over 90% of our staff are cleared, and uh, we're a solutions, prov uh, solutions provider for the intelligence community as well as the Department of Defense. So you'll see 90% of our folks are tech, 90% are cleared. And if you look on the left, those are the things we do for our government clients. What I really want to focus now has been our big push over the last few years, and you'll see the it's about people and culture. Um, the first three slides are really, this is the slide I do for onboarding for our folks, but what I really like to focus on is our intern program, and I'll get into that in a second. Uh, our next idea council, which stands for Inclusion, Diversity, Equity, Advancement, and our giving, pro, our giving back program. 
these really highlight um, who we are as a company at NT Concepts and really um, how much we value diversity and how much we value giving back. So with that being said, next slide, please. So I have two slides here, so I'm gonna talk just a little bit about these because I think it's important to understand our journey and how that can apply to any company out there. It doesn't have to be a government contracting, it can truly be any company. But when I first came into the company at the end of 2017, uh, we were having a discussion and the discussion was, hey, it's really hard to find cleared, diverse tech talent in this area. And so our philosophy was, okay, well then let's, let's go and create our own. And so for a company our size, we, we, we really sort of bit off a lot. We, we took on that first year about 20 interns over the summer. And um, of those 20, 18 were tech. So software developers, data scientists um, were really the focus. And we brought them in and we had them work on real projects as they, as they came into the company. Our program goals, um, and these have not changed since we've had the program. You'll see in the next slide how we've, how we've expanded on those a bit. But our program, oh, sorry, if you can go back, I'm not ready for this slide yet, sorry. I, I cued you wrong there. Um, our, uh, our goals are always the same. So pipeline development is, is certainly, like anybody else, we're trying to create a pipeline of folks. We truly believe, as I mentioned, in giving back. It, it's part of us, it, it, it falls right into our core values. And so part of this is how do we give back to the, to the talent that's out there right now, the interns that are, that are out there right now, and how do we give back to them and help them? We also bring our interns in and they make a material contribution. They give a presentation every year and they actually, no kidding, work on programs and projects that contribute to the overall company mission. This isn't an intern program where they, you know, they get lost in the shuffle or we have them do filing. They're in here doing real work. And the other piece is we use this as a uh, uh, leadership development incentive for our current employees. We have, last year we had 20 interns here and we had a one-to-one -one ratio of near peer mentors. So each intern gets a company mentor and they had a one-to-one -one ratio. So you'll see what we've had there. We've had about seven, not about, we've had exactly 76 interns in the last four years. Um, for us, getting cleared is a very, very important part of the organization. So our goal is to have um, over 30% cleared, which is a, a good ratio when you're looking at interns, and we're at 35% that are in the process are fully cleared now. And we're really focused on increasing diversity in tech. We, we hear this a lot, but our, our point is, let's actually go out there and do it. Um, and, and really the key to our program has been, we haven't fallen in love with anything. We've adjusted the program as we've gone along. We've made some mistakes, we've fixed and we've learned that and we've, uh, and we've partnered with the right folks to help us succeed. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so as we expanded our goals along the way, and this really is where I want to talk about the importance of the partnerships that we've that we've uh, developed along the way, as well as um, how it's important to stay flexible when we increase our goals. So we started this out with a, a formalized internship program, and we continue to expand on that with a focus on diversity. You heard Emily talk about apprenticeships. Uh, we went out, we got registered. And we have a, a certified apprentice program in the state of Virginia. We are, quite frankly, trying to figure out how to, how to implement that in the company right now. There's a lot of work that goes along with doing that, especially because we have um, in-house talent that's acting as the instructor for that program. But really the key to all of this, and it's a conversation that, uh, that I've had with Emily and with Robert, it, it's the growing and partnering. We're all in this together. Um, as, as, we've, as we've done this along the way, we've realized that we're, we're all in this together. And you'll see that I have down there on my fourth bullet, invest in partnerships. At the beginning of this year, we actually invested in a uh, talent partnership manager, a manager of our strategic partnerships, who's actually on our call right now, Cedric, to come in and help us increase uh, women, diversity, uh, vets, all in the tech world. Um, so the transitioning veterans piece, we, we've uh, talked about that and that's what we're focused on as well. But let me spend one second here on the talent partnerships before I stop talking and, and turn it over to questions. But the important part in all of this is Emily and I connected over a year ago and we, we connected through the, the, uh, the, uh, the Virginia Chamber. And then Emily connected me to Robert and then uh, Cedric has connected me to uh, a company called Parker Dewey, which focuses on micro internships, who's also connected to Robert. The bottom line is we're all after the same goal. 
and that is how can we get together and how can we leverage all of our talents um, and expand these partnerships to bring more diversity into tech and to pipeline that diversity. And so you'll see that's ICF and Lead for IT, the Washington Collab. Uh, Parker Dewey is an interesting company. We just brought in um, two micro interns last week um, who are from the Washington uh, Collab. And, and Robert and I had a discussion and, and we brought them in. And a micro internship is they come in and they, they work on a project for us. So I'd encourage folks to check that out. That's another way to get uh, to help try to increase diversity inside the company. And then one uh, organization I left off of here and something I also think is important is we have a lot of universities in this area. And so George Mason is also dedicated to increasing um, diversity in tech. And they've started um, a data analytics program. Uh, it's called a micro certification. And we've also partnered with them on that with a focus on bringing um, vets, transitioning veterans into the into that space or people who might have been um, dislocated from a job and need somewhere to go or some other training. So there are all these these groups out there that when everybody gets together, it really becomes strong in, in developing these uh, partnerships and programs to bring more diversity into uh, into tech. And one of the things here is it's a continuous learning process for us. We are continuously uh, pipelining, we're continuously learning, we're con continuously uh, modifying what we do. Uh, so with that being said, I got over in the amount of time I, uh, I promised, I'll pass it back over to you, Robert, for questions. All right, thank you so much, Chris. So I wanna quickly shift to a round table discussion just to ask a couple of questions about the program and Chris, to get your employer perspective. Now, again, we are a little short on time, but if you have any questions, please feel free to drop it in the Q&A box and we'll try to answer them uh, if time allots, but we will make sure we try to address them. I wanna start with you first, Chris, is can you provide or tell us what technical soft skills are needed to advance and to be successful in the IT industry? Sure, so uh, one thing that I, took away from my Marine Corps career and something that we like to, to say here in, inside of our company is we hire the character, we train the competency. So if somebody has, I mean, certainly we do need senior folks out there as well, but we're talking about entry level folks. It really just requires um, the aptitude, somebody with the aptitude and somebody with desire to actually learn the skill. We can train the competency piece. We've done that with, uh, uh, we have a Veterans Day article coming out in three days or two days. And we've done that with three particular vets. We brought them into the company and we've trained them over the last few years. So I, I would say, Robert, it's pretty simple. It's just the desire to learn and the right sort of character um, that wants to come in here and, and learn. All right, Chris, thank you so much. Emily, I'd like to you turn your camera on because I do have a few questions for you uh, that people want to know. Wanted to find out, is the funding being used to support the wages of lead for IT participants available to other employers? If so, do you have the name organizations that will also support uh, funding uh, for these positions? Definitely, we are actively looking for employer partners right now. So please reach out to me if you yourself are an employer or if you are a, an organization that, that works with employers to set up work-based learning opportunities. Um, we, yeah, we are actively looking to engage employer partners and helping them establish new or scale existing work-based learning opportunities. And, and right, if I can add to that, uh, Robert, I, I highly encourage folks to reach out directly to Emily. Been extremely helpful over the last uh, year and, and pushed me along sometimes when we stalled. So uh, I think there's a lot that that, uh, that ICF and Emily have to offer in this, in this area. So I would highly encourage that. Cool. And Emily, if I can stay with you before going back to Chris. Um, can organization participate in this program if they're receiving other federal grants and other federal funds? Yeah, definitely. We will work with you to identify the, um, the sources of funding beyond uh, the Lead for IT project and, you know, including those ones that you already have identified uh, from state and federal and private sources to be able to support work-based training opportunities. And we'll work with you to make sure that they are stacked um, and braided together, as you will, if you will, um, in a way that is compliant with all the different funding sources, rules and regulations. But yes, other funding sources can be braided with Lead for IT. 
All right. And Chris, to come back to you, how can tech companies provide professional opportunities to employees to ensure success so that if employees from underrepresented backgrounds who are not really entering the field will be able to come up and move to mid-level to senior level positions and not stay at an entry level role? How can companies really work to provide more, you know, upper mobility, upskilling for those who come in at a very entry level type of role and tech companies? Yeah, that's a, I mean, uh, that's a so great question. And I think that the, it isn't just tech companies. I think it's any company uh, can do this. The mm -hmm. way we do it is we do it through our managers. We do quarterly development dialogues. Um, we don't do performance reviews. We do quarterly development dialogues, which is a two-way conversation between the manager and the employee. And during that, it's highlighted if the employee perhaps wants to upskill or do something different. I just had a conversation with Friday, uh, on Friday with someone who's actually looking to move out of her um, non-technical role into a technical role. And so there's the upskilling piece. After that, it, it really is just a function of continuing to work, continuing to get better, and continuing to have those dialogues. Because we, we are very, we place a, a high importance on, on training and furthering education in the company. Um, and, and so we've seen employees grow. I mean, we've had people who've been here with us for 16 years who've gone from, you know, junior developer up to vice president. So it's something we really believe strongly in, but I think it's just constant communication along the way. And, and Chris, to stay with you right quick, you know, has NTC uh, had to overcome any challenges in attracting diverse talent in the region? Yeah, I mean, who? I mean, I think like anybody else in this region, attracting talent, number one, is, is difficult. Um, it is a little bit harder to stand out. I mean, there are bigger companies out there that are well known. Um, we're, we're a bit of a smaller niche company. We're a woman owned company of about 150 folks. So uh, part of that is getting our name out there, which is, um, which is one. But the other part is the more we've partnered with folks, the more talent we've brought into this. And when we bring them in, I think the key is we need to make people feel included while they're here. It's one thing to bring them in the door. It's another thing to keep them which is why I like to highlight the idea council that we have. We have, we have different employee-led uh, councils inside the company that help our retention rate. So it is one thing to attract employees, that's difficult, but getting them here and keeping them is a whole other, is a whole other thing as well. Thank you, Chris. Now, Emily, I wanted to come to you right quick. Is this program open or available for non-US citizens? But that's one of the questions that someone uh, asked or wanted to throw it to you to see if this is available for non-US citizens. That's a great question. Um, yeah, we, so the first, the first thing I would say is that we are actually supporting, Elite for IT supports the businesses. And so you need, to, you need to make the decision, you as the business would make the decision to hire the employee. So obviously they have to be legally able to work in the United States, regardless of their citizen, um, citizenship um, status. So then once you have this, you as the employer have decided to um, employ them, we can support you in coming up with the work-based learning strategy that's going to work best. And, and Emily, a question to you, someone asks is, so where does Franklin Apprenticeship source talent from? Is it local academic institutions, government agencies? Oh man, I wish I had an answer for you there. I would, um, I'd say reach out to me. I would love to set up a conversation um, with you and with our partners at Franklin Apprenticeship so that they can tell you a little bit more about it. I know that they have a, nas a nationwide, na their search really is nationwide. We're so lucky that, um, you know, we're able to fill a lot of these um, positions virtually and they often are finding people who are willing to relocate for the right opportunity. Um, all I know is that they clearly have invested a lot in their recruitment networks. All right, thank you, Emily. And last question for you, Chris, is they, someone wants to know, they would love to hear more about the role universities can play in strengthening the pipeline for diverse health. Yeah, so, um, and I, I mentioned that very briefly, but I think it's especially in this area, and it's not just George Mason, we've got, you know, the largest uh, community college network, I, I think in the country, one of the largest here with Northern Virginia Community College. So there's a lot of work that, um, the local universities are doing with all sorts of different organizations out there. But one of the, one of the keys and, and one thing that I was on a, um, a panel a few weeks ago that we talked about is there is a greater focus, especially on transitioning talent, on getting certifications, on gaining certifications. Um, 
than necessarily going and getting a four-year degree. So universities can help out by doing more of these programs like this, the micro-credentialing programs where folks go in, they get a taste for it, they understand what they like, and then perhaps they go back and they do a little bit more. And then they go and they earn while they learn with, as Emily mentioned, apprenticeships, on-the-job training, and further their education that way. So universities can help springboard folks by offering some of these smaller certifications. All right, and with that, I want to say thank you so much to Emily, to Chris, for this insightful program, Lead for IT. We hope that it really provided insight. I want to just also echo what Chris said for everyone who's on this call and who will be viewing this later on. The role of the partnership in the Capital Collab and in my role is we are looking at the three C's. We are catalyzing opportunities to scale more diverse, equitable, and inclusive talent pathways. Pathways, excuse me. We curate thought leadership to strengthen the educational workforce system, and we are also convening the community practice to advance talent pathway, pathways. And we hope that this webinar, along with the other webinars and a different engagement, will continue to show and solidify how we are the thought leaders in this area and how we're making sure we amplify the need for more diverse talent and how we're leaning in on making sure that we are working with employers, educational institutions, and intermediaries to make sure we are one large ecosystem, as Chris said, that support each other, that make sure that at the end of the day, we are providing equitable opportunities for those students here in the capital region. I do want to show another event that we have coming up. We do have a networking social that's coming up next Wednesday is with CompTIA, we're partnering with CompTIA as they have in this networking social uh, happy hour next Wednesday. Now it's really just for employers. We wanna make sure that we are bringing employers together to really have that come to interact, to engage, and to talk about the need for more diverse talent, but also to talk about the need for how we can collaborate, work together uh, when it comes to different apprenticeships program. So as you see, the event right now is scheduled for November 17th from four to six at CompTIA's downtown DC offices. You have to RSVP in order to attend. It will be following strict COVID guidelines, and you will also have to make sure that you are vaccinated, and we will make sure that we have strict uh, COVID protocols in place with masks indoors and so forth. So we ask that if you are interested for the employers to please register, we would love to see you there. If you have any more questions, please feel free to reach out to myself uh, at the Capital Lab. It's info at greatwashingtonpartnership.com. With that, thank you everyone for joining us. We hope that you learned a lot and that we're excited for our future engagements as well as our continuation in our Diversity Matters series that we have coming up. We have some exciting speakers and we hope that you will join in as we collect work together to make sure that we are providing more equitable opportunities for young adults here in the capital region. With that, thank you so much. Have a great day.